Today we're in a very significant chapter of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 31. A prominent feature here is the New Covenant, uh, beginning in verse 31. But um, there are a number of promises in this chapter. That's why I've called this chapter Promises. In verses 1 through 6, there's promises of God's care for his people. Verses 7 through 14, promises of a return to joy among his people. 15 through 17 talk about a promise of comfort for his people. 18 through 30, a renewal of the nation. And again, 31 through 34, a promise of a new covenant. And then beginning in 35 to the end of the chapter, a promise of, promise of permanence for the nation, that they are going to be permanently restored. So let's take a look at this a little bit more closely, given that outline then. Notice in verse 1 begins, at that time. Well, what time is this? At that time refers back to the end of verse 24, in the latter days. That is at the end of history. Uh, the end of history began with the birth of Jesus and continues right to our own day today as we look forward to the next great event on God's uh, prophetic calendar, the rapture of the church, and then sometime after the rapture, uh, the beginning of that final week of Daniel, that time of tribulation. Look at verses 2 and 3. Some would suggest uh, even today that God is really done with Israel, that all the promises given to Israel are now spiritualized and given to the church, but that doesn't seem to be the case here at all. Uh, in fact, look at the end of verse 3. I have loved you with an everlasting love, therefore I have continued my faithfulness to you. He's speaking to Israel there. He's speaking to the nation. So God is speaking clearly. Speaking literally, he's loved that nation. He will always love that nation. Verse 6 talks about, uh, introduces this phrase, the hill country of Ephraim. Ephraim is a, a word uh, that's used. It's one of the 12 tribes. It's one of the 12, 10 northern tribes. And it's often used uh, as a reference to the northern kingdom, just as Judah is used as a reference to the southern kingdom. So what we see here is that all Israel is going to be going reunited. Uh, that northern kingdom that was exiled in 722 BC will be brought back into the land. And the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom together will go up to Zion and worship the Lord there. So again, this care for the Lord resulting in his worship. Beginning in verse 7 then. And going through verse 9, we see this restoration of gladness. Sing aloud with gladness for Jacob and raise shouts for the chief of nations. So this is great joy that's coming on the nation uh, at the result of uh, regathering from a worldwide dispersal. Look at verse 8. I will gather them from the north country, uh, which is not surprising because Assyria and Babylon are north of Israel. But then look what he says, from the farthest parts of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, the pregnant woman and she who is in labor together, a great company shall return here. In other words, not only from the Babylon and Assyria, but this is looking forward to a worldwide regathering that includes uh, that even the, the lamest of uh, people are going to be caught up and drawn in with the Lord. Uh, this is not the uh, regathering that we see in under Zerubbabel and under Ezra. This is much broader, and it's for those latter days. I point out, in my humble opinion anyway, my reading of prophecy and understanding what's happening in the world, is I think this uh, gathering is happening now. I think Israel is being uh, regathered to the land in a state of unbelief at this point. In fact, just in the past week, um, the uh, Aliyah, the going up uh, to Israel, uh, has been resumed among Ethiopian Jews. 181 Ethiopian Jews returned to Israel in the last week as I'm recording this. And there's a promise for another 3,000 Ethiopian Jews to migrate to Israel. So 
Uh, this is just one example of uh, God's people now being regathered into land in unbelief, and that will continue. In verses 10 and 11, God announces to the nations of the world that Israel has been restored. So as you recall from Exodus 20, uh, God's plan was for Israel to be a witness to him in the world, and here they are, verses 10 and 11, looking forward to those last days where they are going to be a witness to the world um, because of their restoration in a miraculous way, really. Verses 12 through 14, God talks about the um, joy, the abundance that accompanies the restoration of their people to the land. And this is, this is in accordance with the uh, what I call the land covenant. Some call it the Palestinian covenant, but I think a land covenant is the better uh, term. And uh, that's discussed in Deuteronomy chapter 30. So this is all in accordance with God's prior prophecies, his prior prophetic word. As we continue to go through this in verses 15 to 17, we see comfort here. Now in verse 15, we see a voice is heard in Ramah. So Ramah is a city on the northern edge of Israel. It's the city through whom the northern kingdom and likely the southern kingdom would pass through on the way into exile. Rachel is weeping for her children. So he's using, I think, picturesque language here, symbolic language of the weeping uh, that accompanies uh, those going into exile. That there, She's weeping over her children, that is the nation of Israel, going into exile. But in verse 16, we see the comfort that she's going to receive. They're going to receive comfort because they shall return. That's what God is saying here. As we go through this, verses 18 through 30, we see a renewal. Um, we see, especially in 18 through 20, Ephraim, which I've told you is a phrase referring to the northern kingdom as a whole. That northern kingdom is going to acknowledge their sin. That's what these verses say. They will repent of their sin. And again, God affirms that he still loves them, that he still cares for them. Again, for those who say that God is done with Israel, these verses seem to contradict that. These seem to say clearly that God has a future plan uh, for Israel, that he is working out this future plan. He has not given up on them. Verses 21 and 22, real interesting here. I think God is calling them to return to the land. Set up road markers for yourself. Make yourself guideposts. Consider well the highway, the road by which you went. So he's saying, hey, plan your trip, basically. Get out your map and plan your trip. You remember those days before GPS where you had to sit down if you were taking a trip to a new place, sit down and look at the road map and plot your plan or plot your uh, route there and then follow that uh, highlighted map or whatever you used. And that's what he's saying here. Highlight your map and get ready to go back. Verse 22 is a little problematic. It says, For the Lord has created a new thing on the earth. A woman encircles a man. Well, what does this mean? There's a couple different ideas what it might mean. We're, I don't think anybody's quite sure. Some look at this as a prediction of the virgin birth of the Messiah. So this woman encircling a man would be the womb, the womb of the woman um, keeping the Messiah. Others see this as a reference to virgin Israel, who has been disgraced by idolatry, spiritual adultery. She's lost her virginity. But they, she will turn back and re-embrace the Lord. She'll return to the Lord, something perhaps not seen in the ancient world, She'll turn back, and in verse 32 says that uh, she'll turn back to the Lord, uh, who is her husband. So this may be a reference to that repentance and restoration. Hard to tell. Um, be interested in what you think it means, so send me a note or leave a note in the uh, show notes or the comments down below. I'd love to see what you think. Verses 23 through 26, look beyond Ephraim. And now look to Judah. So again, the whole nation's going to be restored. 
And in verses 27 through 30, says that just as God was diligent in chastening them, uh, he will be just as diligent to bless them. The nations no longer could uh, pay for the sins of the forefathers. That the, That is over, that the sins of the forefathers, their idolatry, that they passed on to their children will be completely paid for and the nation is no longer going to be paying for those sins. Verses 31 and following then, 31 to 33, 34, talk about this new covenant, uh, a new covenant with the house of Israel. Behold, it starts out in verse 31. Uh, so God is uh, saying, hey, look, check this out. Look closely at this. Behold, it's taking particular attention. This is a new covenant, one not existing before. A new covenant God is making and notice who he makes it with here. He makes it with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. The northern and southern kingdoms He's making it with all of Israel. A new covenant. In verse 32, he contrasts it with uh, the Mosaic covenant. The Mosaic covenant that is recorded in the book of Exodus. And also the uh, renewal of that covenant in the book of Deuteronomy. Again, Jeremiah is a prophet that continues to call the nation back to adherence to the book of Deuteronomy. And he does that here. And he, he says that the, uh, in the new covenant, in verses 33 and 34, God's going to make this covenant with them, a unilateral covenant. It's my view, it's got seven parts. Um, the first part is that God alone is making this covenant with them. It's a pledge God is making to them. In other words, it's an uh, unconditional, unilateral, and sovereign covenant that the Lord is making. The promise is that there will be an inner transformation. The old covenant controlled and regulated external behaviors. This new covenant is going to affect an inner transformation. Why is this? That's the third feature. God will put his laws in their heart. Not written on uh, stone tablets, but in their hearts. Verse 4, or the fourth thing, is, is that he is going to claim them as his personal possession. Uh, he is going to take personal ownership of Israel. And he will care for them. The fifth thing is all Israel will reciprocate and they will intimately know God. They will have intimate knowledge of him. God will forgive their sins. And then the last point here is that in the covenant is that God will not remember their sins. So kind of two sides of the same corn coin. He's going to forgive their sins. Not remember, not that God is going to grow senile or forgetful. Uh, but that it's as if they never sinned. This is what we would call in the New Testament kind of a justification. Lots of questions uh, about the New Covenant and the relationship with the church. Um, some hold that the church is participating in the New Covenant. Um, others that the church fulfills the New Covenant. Um, my view is that the church has nothing to do with the new covenant. It's for Israel and it's for our, uh, Judah, Israel and the house of Judah. Uh, the blessings of the church today are something like the new covenant, maybe similar to it, but it is not the new covenant. When Jesus said at the Last Supper that he is um, inaugurating, or I'd say ratifying, the new covenant in his blood. He's ratified it there. It's ready to go into place, but it's not yet inaugurated. Sort of like here in the United States where we elect a president in November and he is inaugurated in January. Similarly, I think the new covenant is ratified by Jesus' blood, but not inaugurated until he comes, until Israel calls out for their Messiah, says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and the Lord returns, and the new covenant is then inaugurated. So, verses 35 to 40 then, 
uh, talk about the permanence of the nation. This last promise is that they'll be permanent. They're going to be permanent as the sun, moon, and stars. They will not be, stop being a nation any more than the limits of the universe can be found. And he says, he says, behold, again, calling, you know, special attention in verse 38. Uh, the sign of this is the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Jerusalem will be rebuilt. So how do we apply this to the church today? Well, I'd say that God has not only entered into this sovereign, unilateral, and eternal covenant with Israel, but he affirms these promises in greater and greater detail throughout the progressive revelation in the Bible. He's the God who can't lie. His faithfulness and miraculous preservation and restoration is a testimony to his character. And it's really, brothers and sisters, as Gentiles living in the church age, our privilege, our privilege to worship such a God. God bless you. Enjoy your reading in Jeremiah.